everyone to our very first Insight Speaker Series. And we will be your hosts for tonight, Jeffrey and Leo. First of all, before we start our event, before we get to the fun part, we need to get over the boring part. I'm going to remind you guys about the house rules first. All right. Rule number one, please give your full attention to the speakers. We put a lot of hard work into this uh, project. Number two, please have your cell phones on silent. And number three, if at any point you need to leave the area, then please do so with as little noise as possible. Also, refreshments are free, so feel free <laughs> <laughs> to enjoy them, but only in the refreshments area. Please do not bring food or drinks to your seats. And lastly, there will be a time at the end for Q&A with all our speakers. Please, so please hold your questions until then. So now, let's get the show started. Tonight, we have four wonderful speakers talking about their stories about the beauty and the small things in life. All right. For our first speaker, we have an incoming junior to Portola High School. He has a natural affinity for law, music, and culture. Please welcome, with a warm welcome, Nishad Francis. Hello. As I said, my name is Nishad Francis, and I'm here to talk about my experience as a first-generation American and how that shaped me. But before that, we should probably talk about one thing that probably confuses you guys, the name. What's with the Francis, right? So to talk about that, we have to go into my family history. My mom and dad were born, born in India, in small rural villages. My mom in a small village named Nagarboyle, and my dad in Kutukuri. And my dad's name is Francis Amaraj. And in their culture, it was tradition for him to give his first name to my last name. And it makes no sense, so there's no point in even looking at it like that. But basically what it is is that the names are fluid, and there's no rigid first and last name. So they kind of spread it down. So they both grew up in poverty. They were, it wasn't easy to get three full meals a day. Sometimes their lunch would be rice, and their dinner would be, the, would be the water that was left over from boiling. And that's basically how they grew up. So when my dad and mom got the opportunity to come to America to work as software engineers, they took the opportunity to live the American dream. And I was born here, and my sister later as well. So we spent our entire life here. And I kind of found this balance between my Indian self and my American self. And I found myself sometimes straying away from what people consider your average Indian. And that all started with my last name, Francis. And the reason our names are Francis is because we're all Catholic. And I know that's really surprising for Indians to be. Most of us are Hindu, which is completely true. But my family has grown up in a very Catholic atmosphere. Two of my dad's sisters are nuns in a chapel in Spain. And my entire family has been born around that identity. And from day one, I've basically been born with that idea of not being the same as your average day-to-day -day Indian. And I found that as I continued to grow. Uh, when I was about three or four, I decided that I kind of wanted to play piano. I wasn't sure why, and it had nothing to do with my heritage things. But I just found myself wanting to explore my own path. I enrolled in a piano class with my teacher, her name was Annie at the time, and I started getting into piano. It wasn't easy. I remember my first performance, I was playing a song called Freeway. I was bad. I forgot half the music and I was just struggling to finish and I eventually gave up and almost started crying. But I decided that I really wanted to continue because it was something I loved. And I realized that I kind of started straying away, as I said, from that average Indian meaning, but I followed that through. A few years later, I started playing basketball. Uh, I tried out the average Indian sports, soccer, tennis, didn't really work for me. And I liked the idea of putting a ball in the hoop, so I was like, why not follow what I love? So I started playing basketball. It's really weird, most people in India don't really hear about it. I mean, you know LeBron James, Michael Jordan, but other than that, there's not much to know. But I kind of started following this trend. A few years later, I realized that I kind of liked history in school. I got the opportunity to go to Santa Ana Courthouse a few years ago, and that was really nice seeing everything. And I kind of grew up expecting myself to like science. My parents are software engineers. I have uncles and aunts who are in the IT tech department. I have them, some are engineers. And so I kind of grew up in the STEM category. But I realized myself reaching out to more of the humanities, loving history and loving English, and kind of relating to that kind of thing. It's not the best picture, but it's the point across. 
<laughs> but I kind of realized that I love the evidence and the research rather than just lab experiments and mathematical equations. So that was kind of a big shift because there's no one really in my community that's more of a history nerd. Everyone's into science and medical and stuff, but I realized I really wanted to follow through with this. And enter high school and I make a drastic choice. I decide to join the school choir. Well, to be honest, I didn't want to join it first. My parents kind of forced me to. But then I, I realized that that was something I really loved to do and I continued to do it. This wasn't just straying away from Indian culture, this is straying away from everything I knew. I don't really know anyone that's in choir. If people are in music, they're usually in the band or orchestra, or they're in sports like soccer or tennis. But I found myself kind of going toward a musical route, and as weird as it was, and as unexpected it was, I became a person in choir. I was in alto the first year and a bass the second year. It makes no sense, but our school was small, so they needed to adjust. And I decided I was pretty good at it. I even got a solo and all. So, Come that moment, I realized that I'm basically breaking stereotypes here. I'm not following what's expected to be. Otherwise, I would have never done choir in the first place. And that led me to make a huge life-altering decision. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I grew up. And I thought about a doctor. I thought about being a scientist and all that. I had a brief firefighter stint in there, too. But I realized that what I really wanted to be was a lawyer. And in ninth grade, when our mock trial club was starting up, I decided that's something I wanted to pursue. I quickly became the vice president and I founded it, becoming a vital member and helping our club move forward. And that was really a huge eye-opening moment for me, where I realized that I can be whoever I wanted to be, not just what was expected. I thought I'd like computers and things, I really tried, but it just wasn't for me. And I realized that speaking, like I'm doing right now, is my real passion. So in that moment, I felt really disconnected from what where my roots were. And then I realized that there's a huge part of me that I just haven't thought about, my Indian culture, which is still vital to who I am. We go to India every two years. I look kind of creepy in the back of there, but <laughs> this is a moment where we were just in India traveling with family, going around to places, and I realized that I love talking to my family. I love speaking our native language, Tamil, at home. I love looking and just eating traditional food. And I keep a lot of that culture. When we go to India once in a while, we eat off banana leaves. The logic being that it allows you to become more naturally invested in the food rather than something artificial like a plate. And I found all these things that I wasn't really used to, but I enjoyed. And I realized that I've been looking at this the wrong way. I've been ignoring one side of me. So then I start doing Indian classical music. Let's take a moment to address how Indian this picture looks. Like, can't go any more than that. But I start singing this Indian devotional music. And as you can see, there are Hindu gods in the background which is probably kind of weird, why is he doing that? But it really wasn't a problem for me because the entire thing about the Indian culture was that everyone is, was embraced and welcomed and you can share your beliefs and what you want to do regardless of your point of view. And that was really enjoyable, being able to sing devotional songs for the culture and the meaning that it brought to me. And I kind of realized recently what it all ties back to, the idea of balance. And I felt that that's really nicely symbolized in this picture. I have my American ideals on the left, and the Indian ideals on the right, with the group, with the bride having a veil and an Indian sari. And that kind of represented what I wanted to be. I realized that I can't shut down half of who I am just to think about what I should be. In the process of wanting to be a lawyer so bad, I almost forgot about the simple pleasures, the little things you get when you eat a bowl of rice or off a banana leaf or something like that. And I realized that the importance to life is the balance. Whether it's culture or just leisure versus trying to make the world a better place, everyone has these two different values that they need to balance out. And I realized that instead of forgetting one of them, we need to be both. You can't completely ignore one side of you, otherwise you don't become who you are. And I realized this in the process of finding who I am through music and law and just being Indian. I realized that I love who I am because I'm everything. I'm everything that I want it to be, and I don't ignore anything just for the sake of it. So, when it comes to one thing to leave you guys with, I just want to tell you guys that the times make it hard, you may be unsure what to do, but never forget that who you are doesn't have to be what you're supposed to be. It all depends on what you feel. No matter how small it is, no matter how insignificant you think it may be, just talking to your friends in a different language or something as big as changing your career. 
it all matters and changes who you are to make yourself who you want to be. Thank you. Um, thank you. Great. Um, hi, my name is Brian Sleeves, and um, as we just heard, I'm a recent graduate at UC Irvine. Um, I had two um, bachelor's degrees, one in political science and one in sociology. Um, I now work at the St. Anna Zoo. I'm one of our membership managers, and I'm a lifelong volunteer at the American Red Cross. To start us off today, I'm going to ask for some audience participation. Who's down? Yeah? Okay, great. Go okay, ahead, right. I'm liking this. So, raise your hand if you remember being in kindergarten. A few hands. <laughs> Raise your hand if you remember your first day of kindergarten. That's you, okay. Um, raise your hand if you remember your kindergarten teacher's name. Or first preschool, first grade. Raise your hand if you remember an adult in your life when you were growing up who made a difference in your life. Okay. Those of you who raise your hand, just audibly speak their names at this time. What is the name of the person who made a difference in your life? Audience participation. Dead. Okay, we're getting a few. Great. So I do that for two reasons. One, I know it's a Saturday night. We're going to get you pumping a little bit, right? And two, because kindergarten and adults in my life have made the most important difference in my life. Um, when I was growing up, I started kindergarten, and I had Mrs. Smith here. She was one of my two teachers. My second teacher was Mrs. Karen Cronin. And kindergarten was the greatest time. My life. Who remembers those days? Naps, juice boxes, coloring, cutting, and pasting. I can tell you that much. It was the best time for me um, because of those experiences, but also because of my first day of school. My first day of school was a day of many firsts. First day of school. First day in a learning environment. It was my first time away from my family. My freak flag could fly. Freak flag could fly. And it was also a day where I had my first opportunity to help somebody. On the first day of kindergarten, I walked in, and there was a young, one young man named Aaron. And Aaron was sitting across the room, and I just saw him crying. And I said, Aaron, what's up? My sister has told me kindergarten is the best day and the best year of your life. Why are you crying? And Aaron said, I miss my family, and I miss my mom. And I said, no more of that. This is kindergarten. This is amazing. We're going to have a great time. We are going to go color, we're going to go play on the jungle gym, and we're going to have friendship together. So we, we became friends, and we became friends with one other person named Maria. Now I tell you this story not because I'm obsessed with myself, although I am. Um, I tell you this story because that was the first time that I was able to help somebody outside of my family. That was a time when, although I didn't know it, I went home that night and I told my mom, I want to be a teacher. Had no idea what that meant, but I want to be a teacher and I want to help people. So uh, family is very important to me. Um, this is my first birthday party. As you can tell by the jewel, I love cake and I love Winnie the Pooh. Um, and my family taught me at a young age that helping others is what makes us special and helping others is what makes our life complete. Um, and I didn't quite fully understand that um, growing up through elementary school. Um, I saw a lot of that. I had, as I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Smith and Mrs. Cronin kindergarten. First grade, Mrs. Varma. Second grade, Mrs. Davis. Third grade, Mr. Romero. Fourth grade, Ms. Henriksen. Fifth grade, Mrs. Norman. And I'm not going to tell you about middle school teachers, because that's when you get a lot, and there are way too many. But going into middle school and being in eighth grade, I was part of a class called Peer Assistance Leadership. And this class was all about being young leaders on our campus. We planned Red Ribbon Week. We taught about how drug use is life abuse. We were peer mediators on campus. And we found opportunities for community service outside of the classroom. And the teacher who stood out to me the most here was Ms. Susan Whitmire. And Ms. Whitmire challenged us to become leaders by volunteering. And our first event that I ever did was the CHOC Walk. For many of you that don't know, CHOC stands for Children's Hospital of Orange County. Um, in my family, CHOC is very important. This is me when I was born. Um, but when I was born, when my older sister was born and my other sister was born, um, we all basically lived at Chalk. We had opportunities where we were there for a number of days, a number of weeks. Uh, my sister was born in an incubator because she was born prematurely and we didn't think that she could make it um, a few weeks past her birth. 
So chalk was important to my family, um, and going to the chalk walk that first day, um, of, not the first day of grade, but in eighth grade was amazing for us because uh, my mom and I got to fundraise over a hundred dollars each, and we said we are giving back. We got to spend the morning in the Disneyland Resort walking around with other fundraisers. We said, wow, we're making a difference today. We are finding opportunities where we can share what we had and families like our own are able to help survive um, and, and stay alive because of the work with Chalk and the facilities that they did. So I said, wow, I've got a bug and this bug is biting. I want to volunteer, I want to do more, I want to help. And I knew that I loved this. I didn't know how I knew I loved this. And I'm sure you're probably wondering, you're 13 years old, how do you actually know that you love something? Well, I'll tell you I knew that I loved it because I knew what I did not love. I played soccer for 10 years and it was horrible. Who here plays soccer? No one. Oh, okay, we got a few. Who plays sports? Who's into sports? Awesome. I'm not a sport person. As you can tell, I like everything clean and no sweat and no dirt and no grossness, no grass stains on my, on my uniform. But I was the best runner. Um, I ran away from the ball as much as I could. Um, but I knew that I did not love it. I played soccer for 10 years. When I was 15, I encouraged my parents, please let me stop. I want to start volunteering. I want to give back. Um, and they let me. And that was the best time of my life because it was a moment where I was done. And I said, I'm so done with soccer. But I found the positive piece of this. And I found the American Red Cross. And I found an opportunity to give back. Um, more so than that one shock event, I said, what can I do to start going to community service events, to be a part of a brand, part of an organization that means so much more to people across the world, right? Our motto, down the street, across the country, around the world. We are there, we are the first responders that you see at any natural disaster. And it was amazing to be a part of this organization. And so, one of the most impactful events that I had was at um, the Honda Center here. And I promise, when I took this photo, filters were in. I'll tell you that much, kids. Filters were in, and the guy who took this photo said, I'm gonna get you an artsy photo. I look back and I said, this is not a great photo. But, times change, am I right? Um, and Typhoon on Haiyan was a typhoon that happened in the Philippines. And we were doing a fundraiser at the Honda Center. And this was at 5 a.m. we began. And so, my little 14-year-old self um, had to wake up at four in the morning to get to this event. But we found opportunities where people were driving in and they were donating. They were bringing in $20, they were bringing $100. Kids were bringing in their piggy banks. And I said, wow, we are not just helping our neighbors, we are helping people across the country who need our help. And it was amazing. Now needless to say, this got that bug biting again. And I said, it's time to start doing more stuff with Red Cross. Time to start planning blood drives. Time to start recruiting blood donors. It's time for me to start donating my blood myself. That's a blood donor. Where is that honor, right? Um, and this was amazing because I found that it wasn't just about me going home, doing my homework, going to school, coming home. It was being a part of something larger than myself. I then started taking on leadership opportunities with um, our summer leadership camp, and I made friendships and um, connections that are going to last me a lifetime. And I know it's cliche for us to say that this was life-changing, but this was a life-changing moment um, in my life. And these are people who I've known for many years, and I plan to know many more years to come. The adults in these situations were the Lorraine Gerards, the Madeline Spiegelbergs, the Nargis Akabis. And these people are what gave a piece of their soul and their imagination to make sure that I was a great young leader. I also started volunteering with the Santa Ana Zoo. And this was the best time ever. We had special events where young children came to our zoo and they walked around the zoo. They learned about animals, they learned about conservation, and they learned about so much more than they learned in their classroom. And this was an amazing opportunity because I got to hang out with our Sazu mascot, our monkey mascot Sazu, right? Um, as college, as high school started to wrap up, I realized a lot of these volunteer opportunities and a lot of these um, events were all about me. And it was my growth and it was my development. Um, and I said, there has to be something more. There's got to be one next step. So as I transitioned into high school, um, and as I mentioned, I just graduated from UC Irvine and I loved it. 
Zahar on, if any of you are anteater alumni or hopefuls, um, Zahar. My goal with going to UCI was to pick up that next piece and pass it on. I had an opportunity where, um, I call it a growth opportunity, a growth opportunity where I had a not so great experience at one of our summer leadership camps. And I said, I don't like this. I was ready to quit. I was ready to say, volunteering is a thankless job. Volunteering is something that you don't get a gift, you don't get a paycheck for. Why am I doing this? And I thought back to all those days of volunteering, and you saw all those photos, and I thought back to a quote, be the change you wish to see in this world. And I said, now's yeah, the time. So my friends and I started a nonprofit. We started our own summer leadership camp. And this was based on our principles, based on our values, based on our vision. And this was our chance to take everything that we've learned and pass that on to the next generation. Our camp was called Generation. And this was our first um, camp, camp, camp counselor staff along with our adult staff in the background. And this was, this was my moment. This was my time and this was my opportunity to become something more than myself and share that with others. I also started working at the Santa Ana Zoo. Um, as I shared earlier, um, I am one of our membership managers, so I run our front entrance and I run our membership program. Um, and I get to teach young people about um, conservation, about animals, and about endangered species. And that is one of my other um, true passions and something that I'm able to help share and educate others. Um, adults at the zoo that have impacted me, um, Kathy Decker, Colby Kane, I am also now on our National Youth Council for the American Red Cross. This is a team of 13 individuals. Um, this was from our most recent in-person meeting who work collaboratively um, and remotely to ensure that youth volunteers become a priority in our organization and that the work of the American Red Cross reflects both the younger nature of some of our volunteers um, and that we're still doing great work. So now I'm the chair of the National Youth Council. Um, and with that, we represent over 100,000 youth volunteers across this country who are youth volunteers and making sure that our senior leadership at national headquarters know that we are a force to be reckoned with and that we need to be part of this great organization. I recently just graduated. And it's a point, thank you, um, it's a point of confusion. It's a point of excitement and it's a point of reflection. For me, that reflection comes from knowing that I'm going to do something I'm excited to share that my next steps include being a teacher. I plan on returning to UCI and getting my master's in education and becoming an educator in Orange County and making sure that young people can grow and they can find the beauty in small things and they can find those opportunities of growth within themselves that I was able to find in elementary school, in middle school, in high school, in college. So, um, my two degrees were political science and sociology. Some of those amazing adults who influenced those um, degrees for me, Sean Decker, Diane Chang, Sean Pumizumidar. Those are the people who, again, shared a piece of their life with me and told me, this is the next step for you. Here's how we pass it on. And so my challenge to you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and everybody far in between, is this photo. This photo is me just a few years ago. Um, living my best life, I like to think, and also representing my life motto. My life motto is spread your sparkle. And spread your sparkle to me means be who you are, be who you want to be, and help others be the person they want to be. Spread your sparkle means to me um, defining who you are, helping others find who they are, and spreading what makes them them. So, with that, spread your sparkle, and have a great day. about my journey through ocean conservation. This journey started when I was only a few months old and is still continuing and developing every day. I started learning how to swim when I was only three months old. I know what you might be thinking. Her parents are crazy. <laughs> However, the connection that I have to water is directly related to this early exposure and the ability to feel comfortable in the water even as a baby. Having this early connection to water made me a happier and healthier kid. This is often referred to as having a blue mind. Blue-mindedness is spending time in our outdoor environment, 
especially in or near clean and healthy water, as all aspects of our well-being depend upon it. Not only did my love for water start at such a young age, but also my love and passion for marine life. When I was three, I visited SeaWorld for the first time. That is where I fell in love with whales. I was just fascinated by these enormous, powerful, beautiful creatures. But even as a toddler, seeing these whales in a glass tank, my heart told me something was not right. Shouldn't I be seeing these creatures in the ocean, their real home? I think even then I knew that when I grew up, I was going to do something revolved around protecting our planet. When I was eight, my family and I traveled to Hawaii. It was my first time visiting Hawaii, and it was a trip that proved to be full of many firsts. My first time seeing a coral reef, my first time where schools of fish just swam right past me, and my first time swimming with a sea turtle. It was my first real experience being immersed in a natural marine environment, and it was unforgettable. So at this stage in my childhood, my love and passion for the ocean had already been established. So what was I to do with this passion? Educate myself. In fifth grade, I had an, ass uh, an assignment to write a biography report on an inspirational person. I had a hard time choosing between the conservationist and scientist Jacques Cousteau and the marine biologist Dr. Sylvia Earle. However, Dr. Earle's story just fascinated me as I learned she was one of the first female marine biologists in such a male-dominated field. And choosing her for my report proved to play a significant role in my life, even though I didn't realize it at the time. And looking back, I find it ironic that in, in fifth grade, I was impersonating Sylvia Earle while wearing a wetsuit in front of my class, giving a presentation, acting as a diver and researcher, and now here I am, six years later, a certified scuba diver, doing citizen science research, and preparing to go to college in a science-related major. Throughout the next few years of middle school and early high school, I was really focused on dance and competing, which didn't allow me the time I wanted to spend on protecting our environment. When I was 14, I broke my foot. I was devastated because I had to sit out of dance for the rest of the season. However, there was a silver lining to this unfortunate injury. Taking that time off to heal made me realize I wanted to do something that mattered, something that was important to me. Rather than dancing on stage to win a trophy, because a real trophy to me is a healthy planet. So I decided to step back from dance competition and started volunteering with the Surfrider Foundation's Ocean Friendly Restaurants program. With love and passion as my foundation and merely beginning to educate myself about the ocean in general, my road to advocacy began. My first steps into advocacy was with the Ocean Friendly Restaurants program. That's where I learned that our choices as consumers greatly affect the worlds around us, and making even the smallest changes can make a big impact. Volunteering with this program was a huge turning point for me because I realized as one individual, just one person, I could actually make a difference. I could go and speak to these restaurant owners who serve thousands, and they were very open to making change to better our planet. And after a few months of volunteering with the Surfrider Foundation, I came across an event in San Francisco that I just had to attend. It was a public forum on forage fish, and the discussion was led by a panel of scientists, including my fifth grade idol and world-renowned marine biologist, Dr. Sylvia Earle. I begged my mom to drive seven hours up to Northern California so we could attend the event. Yes. As a sophomore in high school, my idea of fun was listening to a bunch of scientists talk about how fish at the bottom of the food chain are crucial to our ocean's ecosystem. I took tons of notes and had a huge smile on my face, just taking it all in. But the icing on the cake was getting to meet my idol, Dr. Sylvia Earle. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't wipe that smile off my face for days. I mean. I'm still smiling about it. <laughs> but it turned out the icing on this cake was multi-layered. At the event, I, I recognized some representatives from an organization called Heirs to Our Oceans, a global youth-led organization dedicated to solving the problems our oceans face for us and future generations. 
I'd seen their website and heard about what they were doing, and I wanted to get involved, but since they were based in the Bay Area, I didn't really think it was possible. I'm not typically the type of person to reach out and ask for things, and up to this point, I definitely lacked self-confidence. But my drive for wanting to make real change led me to get in contact with the organization. And although it definitely didn't happen overnight, taking that plunge and emailing them led me to start one of the first Air Spar Oceans chapters. And now, suddenly, I found myself in this leadership role as founder of the Orange County chapter. I was organizing meetings, connecting with other organizations, and educating my local community about human impacts on our oceans. I could have never imagined myself in a position like this years prior. Through Air Spar Oceans, I had the opportunity to attend an international youth summit <coughs> called Plastic Ocean Pollution Solutions. Before the summit, there was this screen between myself and the, the vision I had of the ocean. But it filtered out all the bad stuff I didn't really know about yet. But after the summit, that screen just was stripped away, and I was finally able to start to understand the truth behind our ocean crisis. And knowing these issues, I couldn't just step back and hope for improvement. I was inspired and compelled to take action. But before I could ask others to start making lifestyle changes, I had to start with myself. I started replacing commonly used single-use plastics where I could immediately. At that point, I'd proven to myself that plastic was a convenience, not a necessity. Then I was able to better communicate solutions to others. Most people just don't understand how our habits are negatively impacting our environment, which leads back to us and our health. And I found that most people don't even stop to think about that piece of plastic once they throw it away. My passion led me to educate as many people as I could about the problem. My love for marine life and desire for healthy oceans was beginning to take on a new meaning and I began to feel like part of a community that supported my choices and wanted the same outcomes as I did. This led me to face my family, peers, educators, local businesses, and even legislators about their single-use plastic habits. But let me tell you, this was not as easy as I had hoped. Getting my stubborn 65-year-old grandpa to break his 40-year-old <laughs> habit of drinking coffee from a styrofoam cup daily felt like a losing battle at the time. No straw, please, does not always resonate with restaurant servers. So even with all this knowledge and extensive resources, the biggest challenge I have is trying to convert others to a plastic-free lifestyle. This path that I'm on, advocating for healthy oceans, has had ups, but has definitely had downs along the way. And as I further educate myself, I see some pretty awful stuff. I read articles about sea turtles being entangled in fishing gear and whales washing up on beaches with their stomachs filled with plastic. Sadly, I've had to look at bleached coral in some of the most beautiful places in the world. And I've seen firsthand the mounds of waste, including so much plastic, washing up on this uninhabited island, which also turns out to be a turtle nesting ground. How awful is that? Sometimes it feels like all the problems are too big to tackle, and frankly, it's pretty frustrating. It's so easy to get caught up in the negative and give up, but that is just not an option for me. I find beauty among all the problems because I know there's no quick and easy solution. When my friends send me pictures of themselves using a reusable straw or water bottle, that to me, that's a victory. Seeing people who never gave the health of the planet the time of day starting to understand how crucial this problem is, that means there's hope out there for all of us. And cleaning Getting my hands dirty, cleaning up beaches with other folks and youth around the world, or even making movies about plastic pollution like I did while I was in Palau this summer, that's when I feel the most inspired because I realize I'm not alone in this movement. Over the past few years as I've dove further into ocean conservation, I've grown so much as a person. I'm able to think critically about problems that are being pushed onto my generation. I'm a better leader and communicator, which I can apply to other aspects of my life. I've learned to think globally, to consider all nations and communities who can't always voice their opinions. As I'm entering my senior year of high school, I'm naturally brought to a fork in the road. But I know whichever path I take, 
I will continue to personally work towards an even more environmentally conscious lifestyle, expand my outreach, and to continue to be active by having a voice for our blue planet. The message I would like to leave you all with tonight is to truly identify what you are passionate about, no matter how small you may think it is. Then make that passion a part of your lifestyle. Don't be afraid to own your passion no matter what other people might think or say. Don't give up on what you believe in because change does not happen overnight. And collaboration is key. Working together is when we make real change. Thank you.
And after high school, I took college entrance examination. I failed once, I failed twice. Third, I made it. So I, how many times I failed the entrance examination in Korea? Five times, right? You know what that means? I'm a failure. In Korea, I'm a failure, right? Because you cannot, you cannot continue with your education. And especially in Korea, it's, it's very class, uh, class society. So if you graduate a certain high school, your success is guaranteed. So it's all tiered, uh, many different tiers. So losing father, no money, failing all these goals, do I have future or not? I have, I have no future. I was a failure. Truly, just no future, period. But my mom decided to come to this country, and then we came here. And that story changed. When I came here in 1975, I joined the Army, United States Army, not speaking any English, uh, just basic uh, English. And I served three years. While I was in, 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 in the military, I went to school, so I finished about 30 units of college unit. So I still recommend everybody to join a military because it's a good place, and you can earn credit, you can, there are a lot of benefits. It's, it's your problem not, to, not joining and complaining about the society. There are opportunities. The problem is you yourself, not the system, not the country. This country can provide you with all kinds of opportunities. But it's me not taking that opportunity and still grudging about uh, this country and blaming about people, blaming about the system. But it's not the system, it's that you have the problem. So that's the, that's the problem that we have in this country. Many people don't even know how to appreciate what we have, what government offers, what the society is providing for us, but we're still blaming. So after, after uh, three years of service, I served in Hawaii, it's a nice place. <laughs> I have no complaint. Uh, but just imagine that you don't speak English or you have to serve three years. I couldn't even uh, understand uh, attention and then studying with attention and, and a forward march and all that stuff. I had to see if they move, I had to move. But that was the beginning. But I finished school there and after I, I was discharged from the Army and I uh, attended school at USC of Trojan. And uh, I met my wife there. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, this country, especially the young people, that this country is probably the best country in the world providing the opportunity. It's up to you to go there and grab it and move forward and succeed. But we're not doing it, we're still complaining. And also for parents, sending the school is not all. But also you always talk to kids to be successful, go to school, be somebody special, be a lawyer, doctor, and all that. Then what? It's not what you what you're becoming. It's who you are that's very important. But our parents always think about the financial, especially financial well-being, if you make good money, and you're okay. And it's not necessarily true. Pursuing your career and doing the things that what you want to do is very important. Probably, if I if I wanted to make money, probably I could have made a lot of money, like everyone else. But my heart was with different uh, area, because you, you know, I had a hard time in Korea, but coming here was always already a blessing to me. And I came here, I joined, um, while I was in school, I had to work uh, to support um, myself financially. So I worked for, so I started working for KYCC, Korean News and Community Center. I dealt with lots of, lots of, uh, you probably don't even know, it's KK means Korean killers, using a gang member, and also KGK, Korean girls killers. So we have all kinds of gangs youth gang members and they carry guns and they, they sold uh, uh, drugs and many got caught and I did a lot of counseling for them. And that was the beginning of my career in uh, social service. I had a good time because I was able to help a lot of kids and uh, I felt good about it but there is no money. So uh, you know continuing on with uh, community work I studied KC, Korean American College and did a lot to help the community. And I met this uh, young lady who was dumb enough to choose me, to marry me. <laughs> and I told her clearly that uh, you know, I, I have no way of making money, so if you, have to, you have to make money. I said, no way, no problem, I'll take care. I still regret that she said that. <laughs> but uh, I don't regret that uh, you know, I, had, I, I had my career in nonprofit and political things, but 
I had, I had a good time with my wife, my kids. I have four kids. They all grew up in this country. This is great country so far. And as this, this will be the great, greatest country in the world. And, and, but the people here living here don't know how to appreciate it. That's what I see. They, they hate this country. Then why don't you go to someplace else? But they don't want to go away. But still complaining. A lot of times we don't know how to appreciate what we have. Even parents, even kids. We don't know how blessed we are. So I, I strongly suggest, I just like you guys, volunteer somewhere and go to especially the foreign countries, then you will start feeling that the America, that how much we give to our people and uh, start appreciating it and start sharing it. It is very important, but unless you just work for yourself, try to uh, enrich yourself, try to just take care of yourself, this country will be a miserable place. Here I am, and I feel that I'm very successful because I met my wife and I have my kids. That's, I think, the best thing I did. But my wife, my wife, she was born in Korea. Uh, she finished her elementary school and went to Guam. And then uh, she finished junior high and moved to Hawaii, finished her high school, and went to USC. That's where I met my wife. And that young lady who majored accounting, uh, like, wanted to do business, uh, start a business, but I told her, kind of recommend her to work for political office. Like I, I saw kind of potential, but she was kind of hesitating. But she, she started working for uh, back then, uh, Senator uh, Ed Royce, and she did well, and he won the congressional seat. And she moved to work for him for her in his congressional office. And 23 years later, now she's running for Congress. And in 39th Congressional District, if she wins, she will be the first Korean American uh, woman serving in the uh, U.S. Congress. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. Somebody who was born to Korea. <laughs> Somebody who was born in Korea. Never, you know, when she was growing up, she, she had just nothing to do with the English. But she went to Guam and Hawaii and USC. If she got her education, and she did her job of working hard and learning what's happening with uh, political offices. Now is her opportunity to, to run for, for Congress. And last, last uh, uh, June primary this year, she came in first out of 17 candidates. She will be running against uh, Gil Cisneros, who is a uh, lotto winner. You know how much money she he won? $266 million. So not just $266,000, $266 million he won. And he lives in uh, Newport Beach, and he spent, he spent about $5 million of his money to come in second. My wife spent uh, $1 million, and she came in first, because she's been in the community, in the district. So that's how she won. Now in November, she'll be fighting against him. He said, whatever it takes, I'll spend to win. So it's a tough battle, but I think she can win. I, I'm going, uh, I feel that you know, she's going to win. But what I'm trying to tell you is that, especially young people, you know, a lot of times we learn how to blame first instead of uh, appreciate. But learn how, how blessed you are. You want to stay here with your friends and attending, uh, attending this, uh, you know, this, this session, uh, coming here. Because I have worked with many kids in downtown and South Central, and those are gang members. Without, you know, how many of you actually heard about latch kid, uh, latch kid, kids? Latchkey kids. Yeah. They don't have. Yeah. Probably you, you know what that means, right? You know, we have we have, we have to take care of a lot of kids who just carry their uh, keys here because there's nobody at home. Nobody at home. But at least your parents you have someone at home. At least somebody is making money for you. At least they're sending you to school. They drive you up. They don't have cars, so they have to take the bus. How lucky you are. But we don't see that, how lucky I am. But mom, I don't have this, mom, I don't have that. But, so it's not about money. It's about what we provide. The families, family kind of is kind of breaking apart this country. And that's so sad. We have to build this family. Family is the basic unit. Family is the, without family is the foundation. But I see the breaking uh, families everywhere, and that's so sorry. It's not about money. And they take, once you, those who have money, they get into a, a drug. 
And this one young lady that I, I counseled, she was about to go to the jail, and she drives a BMW. And uh, her father has his business, uh, her mom has separately never made tons of money. And she actually, uh, she was spending all the money for this young, uh, you know, gang member. And she got me. I'm going, I'm not going to detail, but at the end, I, I had, a counsel, had to do counseling before she goes to the, uh, you know, prison. And I told her, my mom that you have to make choice. Your, your daughter or your business. So you, one of you should quit uh, business and take care of your, your, this precious young lady. And actually, mom decided to quit her business. So that was good. But we have many kids who don't have, many kids who have too much but don't know how to appreciate. So just learn how to appreciate and move forward with your career that you would like to do. And thank your mom and dad. And also, parents, I'm providing, we have this tenant. You know, I'm giving you a car, I provide this, I'm doing this, I'm, the, I'm doing all this. Why are you complaining? It's not their issues. What they need is not money. What they, is not, what they need is not BMWs or sports cars. They need probably attention. But if you spend too much time running your business and don't take care of your family, maybe it's about time that you think about it. Am I, am I doing a good job as parents? They need time. They need, because I'm, I'm, I'm providing all this, you should be thankful, and you should satisfy. Don't complain, just go out there, and do your study, and go to school, school and be a lawyer, a doctor, and that's probably, probably what you hear from, from your parents, but that's not it. But what I'm telling you is, small thing is not small, big thing is not that big. So if you start dreaming and start aiming for success, you can get there. But if you complain about the tiny little things, that little things become big things and it'll haunt you, and you'll be overwhelmed by, by those problems. So, um, very simple message. It's about you taking care of your life. And don't complain about your parent. Don't complain about your kid, because you have to take care of your own life. And unless you be failure, at the end, are you satisfied with your life? So sometimes I just sit down and ask myself, I feel sorry for sometimes my kids, because I could not provide them to have all the you know, necessities that they need. They work, but they part-time work, and they, they take care of their own, they grow up okay. Oh, and they school finished, and then to marry, and uh, to still uh, dating, and they're going to get married soon. But I told them clearly that I cannot provide you financially, but you learn how to how to make your career and make your life, and at the same time, oh, I can give you is uh, be a good parent. You know, I, I, told, I told my mom that same thing. You haven't done anything financially for me, because we had to support a foundation, but I thank them because they give, they give us all the love that we need. That's what we need, it's not the money. So parents, please don't forget that they just don't need, uh, you know, just give them enough money, they will be happy. When they receive money, they're happy. Until they, they need you know, this sort of money from you. But money is not the solution. But I think your attention, your care, uh, you being there is more important. And kids, learn how to appreciate it. Because you're so lucky. I have seen many, many, many kids who are worse than you guys. And learn how to, how, to, how to appreciate to your parents because to give you something, they have to work hard. Driving Mercedes, driving BMW, your friends are driving, so we, mom, I need BMW, my friends are driving. No, that should be way. What have you done to deserve that? Think about it. Why do they have to give you so much? Why I, it's not what you don't have, but you feel you feel bad because others have better than what you have. That's why you're not happy. happy happiness is relative, it's not absolute. So please think about your future, and start appreciating, thanking your parents, and they can make the difference for you. And then parents, and they're the most precious, you know, to me, I can give up everything and anything for my, my kid because that they're most important. It is important, but they don't need money. They need love, they need your time, they need your care. You being there is more important. So uh, through this kind of setting, uh, uh, sessions, and I, I, just, I think you guys are okay, because you always <laughs> spend time uh, coming, uh, you decide to come here, at least to attend this session. And that's important, because there are a lot of many people who don't even consider coming here. So I give you a lot of credit for coming here. 
and listening to a wonderful speaker and uh, spending a precious Saturday evening. And that's very important, coming here together and listening and the sharing, that's important. So uh, let's not complaining, let's start appreciating. Mm -hmm. And let's think about the small things can be big, and small things are not really the small thing. Big things are not really that big, because anything is possible if you can work together if you move forward uh, uh, for your own career, because you have the duty to move forward with your parents' legacy, but they have done a lot. Everybody has a story. Every family has a story. It's all success story, especially down in the lower line, there are many successful people. But I have met many successful people, billionaires, plus I met so many people who don't, don't have even one-tenth of what you have. So people <coughs> here, you're lucky, but that's only financially maybe. But as an individual, just think about what you can do for yourself at the same time. How can I make a contribution to, to the society and to make life happy? So last uh, 60 years, I just turned 62. Uh, last 60 years, uh, if someone asked me, are you happy with your life? I said yes, because I have good parents. Uh, I have good loving parents. I have uh, loving kids. Kids, more than anything else, I have a good wife, and you know, and I we have something to do with uh, uh, in our career and politics. But uh, I'll leave with you, uh, this message to you. One is, if you can find one thing, you can bet your life. Just one thing, you're a lucky person. If you if, if you can do whatever you can, entire life to satisfy something that you really truly believe that's important. You're a lucky person. If that thing can change this world a little bit better place to live, you're doing something for this guy. And that's important. It doesn't matter if you're in science, art, or environment, whatever. If that leads you to your heart is there, move forward. Even though you know a lot of people worry about you're not gonna make money and all that, but money is secondary. You know, we only have three times a day, not five times a day, right? <laughs> you know, Going to a McDonald's or going to a fancy restaurant. Because of my wife, you know, today I went to Montage and probably they ate one of the most expensive meal there. <laughs> At the same time, I go to Korean town, I can't eat you know, $5 a meal. It's okay. I don't care. Because eating is only just good enough to, if you can feed yourself at least three times a day, to keep yourself healthy. That's good enough. But the thing is, where are you going? Are you happy with your life? I think that's, the, that's what makes the difference. So, you have parents, you, got, you you have a responsibility for your kids, but your kids are doing really well. You should satisfy and thank them. Kids, you can thank your mom and dad for providing all this. By doing that, you know, we can move forward. And in the process of moving forward, if you can benefit the society, and think about those who are not fortunate enough, and you can help them to they help their own life uh, easier. So we can, we can all live together. So little things are not that little. Small things are this small. It's not that big. There's nothing impossible, and I think you guys can make a difference. Thank you. Speakers, a round of applause again. It went by quickly. Did you have a good time? And a wonderful time. Didn't we all? Yes. For our Q and A session, we will welcome up our advisor, Nathan Yu. Hello and thank you again to everyone who came and of course to our wonderful speakers. If we could have actually the chairs brought up and I'm going to ask if the four speakers would be comfortable to come back up, maybe answer some questions. I know that some of you guys might not have prepared individual questions in advance, so I'm going to ask the four speakers to share all one thing and that's going to be a small thing for this week. So one of the things that I like to do in my meetings uh, to start off and uh, to break the ice a little bit is have students to share something good that happened to them this week, something bad that happened, and something they're looking forward to. We call it a, a rose, bud, and a thorn. I think Brian actually has worked with a lot in the past is familiar with it. So you guys can go ahead and just share something from this week that you like, that you didn't like so much, and something you're looking forward to. It can be anything. Hopefully it's appropriate. Um, and hopefully it's enough time for the audience to come up with individual questions that they would like to ask the speaker. So who would like to start us off? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Did 
this week, something good that happened to me is that I got to spend time with my cousin who lives in Boston, and she was here. We got to hang out over the pool and stuff. Something bad that happened is um, summer is almost over, and <laughs> something I'm looking forward to is well, school starts Tuesday, and I look forward for that to be over. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so, a rose, something great that happened this week. Um, no, I'm blank. Um, but something great that happened um, this past weekend, I hosted our summer leadership camp, um, which I've been doing every year since 2010 um, with some of our young high school students, and that was really great. Um, that also brings me um, a thorn, something I did not like. It's over, um, but one of the really cool things that Bud um, is that this week has been a lot of planning and, and uh, getting ready for next year as we prepare for that. Um, I'm still totally wrapped up in camp mode, and so I'm sorry that my rosebud and my thorn are all um, related to camp, but it was very fun this week. Well, something good that's been happening that I'm actually really interested in is that our mock trial season is kind of starting up again. So we started, yeah, you know. So we've started looking back at our case packets, and we started reviewing, especially for a leadership team, it's really nice because since we go to Portola High, everything's new for us, so we're kind of making it up as we go along, so that's really nice. Something bad that happened is that, uh, let's see, SAT scores could be better. <laughs> <laughs> Practice SAT scores can always work on. And something I'm looking forward to is just that first day of school when you see everyone and see how your teachers are and how the new classes are going to be. That's something I'm looking forward to. about my dog. Uh, I don't know why, but because of weather, I got a notice from my neighbors. My dog was barking too much. <laughs> <laughs> and good thing was, uh, actually last night, uh, I've been helping one, uh, one of the radio stations program for uh, the free cruise for the those who cannot afford. Uh, we had about 30 families who went there, and we had that reunion last night. And it was really good that uh, we all appreciate each other. So that was the best thing. So now, if you have hands, we also have some volunteers who are going to be around if you need help crackling in a question as well. Um, does anyone have any questions for the speakers? It can be to an individual speaker or something you would like to hear from all of them. Okay, sure. Right here with the um, So, Rashad, uh, how do you balance your uh, Indian American identity at school? That's a good question. Uh, so, for example, I have this whole, like, for example, it's kind of weird because when I go into science class, I get bored out of my mind. But I feel that, to answer your question properly, I find balance by like who I mingle with. Because like I have this idea of just basically talking to everyone that wants to be talked to, basically. So I have a, we have this, uh, everyone calls us the Indian gang, per se. Not because we're like a gang, because we're like this close-knit community of people who like we get together and play volleyball sometimes. We go to someone's house and like have sleepovers. We go to the movies and things. So I keep that balance by keeping that idea of community safe while still embracing my American side by loving history and mock trial and things like that. Thank you for the question. Okay, another team jacket. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have a question for Charles Kim. Uh, what was your proudest moment in your life? Uh, probably married my wife. <laughs> that was my insurance for my life. <laughs> uh, I have an actual question. Uh, Rashad, could you actually sing for us? <laughs> Whatever you choose. I just want to hear you sing. Okay. Um, I'll put that back. <laughs> Oh.
Okay, okay, Matt. Uh, I have a question for Chloe. Um, I, I also have a lot of great interest within the ocean conservation and stuff like that. And knowing that your biggest challenge was to prevent other people from being able to use plastic and, and that plastic, uh, such as the Great Pacific uh, Garbage Patch within the Pacific Ocean, is a great challenge uh, toward the marine life uh, ecosystem and stuff like that. Where do you see yourself in the future? And, and how do you think that, that, that your future self would be able to, uh, to challenge this um, problem that we have in our world today? So right now I'm not perfect. I mean, I still buy shampoo and plastic and stuff like that. So in the future, I hope to work towards a more environmentally conscious lifestyle by eliminating even more plastic. And I don't know if I could ever go zero waste, but it's a cool goal to try. So yeah, thank you. <laughs> Besides not using a plastic straw, what are the other things to get rid of? Um, some really easy things that you can do is eliminate using a plastic straw. You, if you need a straw, you can use a metal one or bamboo or um, glass. And also using a reusable water bottle, bringing reusable utensils with you wherever you go, using reusable containers instead of Ziplocs, reusable bags instead of plastic, stuff like that. It's pretty like simple to just switch over just some small things that we use every day. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for Nishad. Um, how do people usually react when um, they realize that you're a Catholic Indian? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> anywhere from five minutes of shock to an audible, wait, what? <laughs> so, um, this has happened a lot. Um, between being Catholic and being interested in like law and things. Whether it's, for example, my Indian singing teacher, his name is Babu Parameshwaran, he is like revered in the community, he's amazing. But like when I told him I was kind of interested in being a lawyer, his first response was, wait, not a doctor? <laughs> <laughs> as far as it comes to Catholicism and all, uh, no matter what happens, no matter who it is, Indian community, anyone, there's always this brief moment of confusion because it's really not what people expect. So it's really weird, but it's also really funny seeing everyone being surprised for the first time. I saw people in the audience too. It's always, it's enjoyable, but it's always interesting how confused people get, yeah. Uh, I have a question for Chloe. When encouraging people to like produce less waste or taking like any actions to help better the environment, who's mine was the easiest to change and who's mine was the hardest to change? Um, it's really easy to communicate to people my own age and the younger generation because they're still adapting and they want to have clean beaches in the future and they want their kids to experience clean beaches and everything that we have experienced so far. But older generations don't always like want to make changes there already set in stone, they have their habits, it's hard to break, and they don't really understand why they need to make change. They're not going to be around in 50 years sometimes. So yeah, it's easier to communicate to people my own age rather than adults. Uh, okay, uh, this is for our speaker, Brian. So what was the biggest impact you had as a volunteer on a single person? Um, I don't know. Um, and I don't know because usually, as I said, volunteering is a thankless job. And um, I don't often get people who come back and will say, thank you, or you really changed my life. But um, one of the things recently that happened um, is right now we've got a um, camp reunion going on for the camp I just came back from. and. Um, I sent some nice little congratulatory texts to our volunteer student leads, and I said, hey, great job this week, you did amazing. Um, you're going to see the impact that you just had um, this past weekend at your reunion tomorrow, and you're going to be able to see how much those young people have grown just in those three days since you haven't seen them, right? Um, and I got back some, some responses to those texts, and it was really nice. They, they responded with, you know, thank you, of course, but then, you know, we couldn't have done it without your guidance. We couldn't have um, put together um, 
as warm and as welcoming as a, of a camp and an experience for young people um, without the support of adults. And so that's my reminder that a role of an adult is always important and that the guidance that we provide as young people um, and as young adults and, and as older adults is finding how you connect to younger people and how you pass on information to them. So um, it, it's never really been anything where I've been able to say like, this has been my biggest person who's, who's changed and who's grown because I've known some of them since their first day of high school um, to now being in, high, in college and doing such great work. Um, so it's always just a reminder of, to myself that I have to continue doing the work I do um, so others can continue growing. I think we're going to allow for three more individual questions and also I think kind of my character of this event as well. If the speakers have any questions that they'd like to ask each other, I'll let you guys have that floor after three more individual questions. And after that we can wrap up. So does anyone else have a question for any speaker or all the speakers? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I have a question for you, uh, Mr. Solis. So, you know, as an incoming senior, I'm looking to... Uh, I'm looking into colleges, and UCI is uh, one of my options. So, what kind of, what's the campus like? What's the atmosphere like? Basically, how is UCI? UCI is the greatest. Um, <laughs> and as I said, it's not hard, it's not on, always and forever. It's not, it's not, it's not. Um, I want to go to UCI from the time that I was like six years old when I first found out what college was. Um, and my mom was going to UCI, and I said, can I go with you? That sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, but UCI is beautiful. It's um, all designed in a circle around the center of the um, school, which is Aldridge Park. Um, and so the campus is split up in a ring. So a lot of my friends who like went to UCLA and like Berkeley were like, oh, I have to go all the way across North Campus to get to South Campus to get to the science wing for this one class that I hate. And I said, oh, go to UCI. There's your solution. You don't have to cross the entire campus. You go through a beautiful park. Um, you're surrounded by people um, who love Orange County and love the weather here, um, and you don't have to cross everything. But um, UCI is really beautiful. It's one of the top schools um, in the country. I feel like I'm doing a promo for UCI. It's one of the top schools in the country and one of the youngest um, that are in the top. So um, go Ant Eaters. Um, and if you have questions about UCI later, let me know. Um, it's a beautiful campus that has lots of opportunities for um, civic engagement, volunteer groups, um, and opportunities to grow um, within leadership there. So check it out. Um, and for those of you that are looking to college, grab a tour. Grab a tour. That's all I'll say of UCA. Uh, go ahead. Um, I have a question for Mr. Kim. So you said you came here after college to America? After I failed college entrance exam. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I should be okay because I lived here 40 years, so. <laughs> but actually, you know, uh, there's a mandatory requirement for you to learn English, you know, but not spoken English is to pretty much, you know, learn how to write or read. But uh, I took a crash course by joining USL. You have no choice but speak English. And so I, I couldn't understand the Ford, Mars, you know, all this, but, uh, but then that took those three years as really, uh, actually helpful for me because it was kind of crash course. So, so I, I encourage many people to join the army. And not only you serve the country, but actually can get a lot of benefit out of it. So it's not a bad idea. And joining for military and becoming an officer, and this country is still the greatest country. The way they serve and help uh, and support the military is, I can tell, and probably number one in the world. I strongly recommend if you're not study time, join the army. <laughs> you can actually earn three years of your time and you can still go to school at night. Uh, it's, it's a great place that you can actually think about your future. Okay, sure. I have another question for you, Mr. Kim. Uh, your life was very rich and, and it has a very big jump. Uh, throughout the whole entire life, did you have a part where you didn't know what to do, or or did, did you, or did you know which direction that, that you um, purposely wanted to go to? Only thing I can say is I follow my heart. Uh, it was never money was a factor. I never uh, regretted what I did and what I have done in the community. And you know, first thing, 
led me to the second one and third one. So, um, you know, looking back sometimes while not knowing, it's, it's not because I planned it, but looking back, gee, I did a lot. Uh, I helped some people and their life a little bit easier. So you, you'll be satisfied by helping other people. It's a great joy that you can feel. It's not about money. When people come, and I have, I have actually a long time ago, uh, we studied the first SAT prep course in Korean community. I helped uh, them to apply for financial aid. When they come back and say thank you because can I get I was able to go to college because you have helped us filling out the you know FAFSA forms and all that and you know, it's feel good that some people somewhere appreciate what you're doing. Uh, so that's that's probably the most precious thing that uh, working in nonprofit and helping people and it will make other people's life easier and that way you'll be satisfied. You don't make money but you know I get appreciation and uh, I meet so many good people. They're my assets. And then, was there anything that you guys wanted to ask each other? You guys, no, you guys are sick of sitting up here. <laughs> Spotlight. Anyone? All right. Just, well, oh yeah, go ahead. Just, he mentioned about UCLA. Come to USC. <laughs> <laughs> school you love. Um, I was thinking about this after my response. A any college is great. Like I said, I have friends who went everywhere. Um, and the thing that makes college Im impactful and makes it amazing is finding the things that you love to do. So whether it's USC, <laughs> fight on, um, or you're an ant eater, um, do something you love. Um, and, and that's it. But college college is a great option um, if you're looking into it. So. Actually, my daughter, one first daughter went to UC Irvine. UC Irvine. <laughs> <laughs> I also, you know, I'm helping UC Irvine starting the Korean Study Center, so I have a lot of collections of UC Irvine, no doubt about it. But uh, I had lunch with Terry Donahue, who was a football coach for UCLA. So we had a good talk, but uh, come to USC. <laughs> both the big things and the small things that have gone into these events. So if we can start off actually, let's have the speakers rise. Um, let's give them one more round of applause. <laughs> we actually have a little, just a very tiny thing prepared. Um, you know it's a, not a huge audience, but you guys put so much work and time and effort into crafting your messages for tonight. So we have just a, a small rose and a thank you card if you would be so humble to accept. to the speakers. Um, maybe they only want to hear about super amazing accomplishments. They're not interested in hearing about details of people's lives. But I think the way that the speakers craft their stories um, to really color in who they are as people and their values and what they believe in, I think that's something that helps us to understand each other better so that we can communicate better and also serve each other better and make this place a better place to live. So I want to thank you guys for coming, for having good questions, and of course for supporting those who are up here today. So thank you. I'd like to recognize some of the students who put in a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into making this happen. 
Um, we wanted to make an intimate event where people could feel like they had the time to ask questions or really get to know the speakers well. So as I call your name, if you could just rise, and if, as an audience, you can hold our applause till I've said the last name. Um, let's go ahead and recognize them. So can we have our hosts, Leo and Jeffrey? but to also be able to think critically and try to gain diverse perspective. So she's in the way back here. She's been running around, but this is Mrs. Go. And as we've seen tonight, there's so much that we have to learn about each other. So we are hoping to host future events like this. If you know anyone, you know, a speaker, audience member, if you want to speak yourself, or if you want to be a part of the planning team, there are two sign-up sheets in the back. It's also a free event, and we don't really make money off of this, so if you want to donate to help us to continue to host the event, that's all over there. Um, speakers, if you're willing to stick around and speak with some individuals, that would be great. Otherwise, thank you again so much for coming, and I hope you have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming out, and I really want to thank, I want to give a round of applause to Nathan. Oh. Thank you, Nathan. 